priest of uh, Saint Stanislaus, and uh, a few considerations today. Go back to the seminary. First of all, general announcement. I will make that uh, for the um, the end of the school year here, that we'll have um, at the end of June, we'll have uh, the the doctrinal conference, family conference, like the last few years. So that that. Uh, and it'll be the weekend of June the 23rd. The weekend of June 23rd. So that means all day Friday the 21st, Saturday the 22nd, Sunday the 23rd. And so the, the, the hope we're going to get people to come in for the doctrinal conference. Uh, and that uh, June the 20th, uh, they should come on Thursday the 20th. Uh, they should arrive Thursday night. And then all day Friday the 21st, full day Saturday the 22nd. Concluding on the 23rd in the evening. And uh, and so the uh, and then afterwards, the women's nation retreat, just like the last couple of years, week of June 24th through the 29th, and then uh, so and then the men's retreat, uh, July the first through the sixth, uh, here in Kentucky. So that uh, the uh, doctrinal family conference over the families and the and the uh, uh, coming to this uh, week weekend of. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, all day Friday, Friday morning, Saturday, and Sunday, June 21, June 22, and June 23, and then immediately followed by the Women's Ignatian Retreat, uh, June 24 to the 29th, and then the Men's Ignatian Retreat, July the 1st, Monday through July the 6th, Saturday, as we've done the last couple of years, the last three years, and this should arrive on Thursday for the Doctrinal Conference, and family conference, those families, and people that attend all are invited to come and attend, the doctrinal conference, the family conference with the seminarians. We're taking the boys and the girls for like a summer camp type activities with the uh, uh, catechisms and then games and uh, run by the seminarians. And then with the adults, uh, they'll be with the uh, conferences and catechisms by the priests here at Lady Mount Carmel um, and uh, on that uh, 21st, 22nd, and 23rd, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday, 24th through 29th. The men's Ignatian, women's Ignatian retreat, and then the women, men's Ignatian retreat, July the first through the sixth. So, in any case, a few considerations on the feast of Saint Stanislaus and the Father's Holy Ghost. Amen. So, coming back to our our third trimester, so to speak, we're finishing up the second semester of the school year, of the seminary, and remember that we're in a battle of the faith. And uh, it's the same battle it's been since the beginning of time. But remember that we are united in the combat for the faith by our Holy Roman Catholic faith. We're united by the truth of faith, united by the, the, the fight to spread the faith and to spread the gospel as our ancestors spread it. And part of this fight, of course, we have to combat the errors of the modern world, the heresies of the modern world. But remember that the, we're not united in any anti-movement. I was telling you earlier in the discussion on this battle in which we are. We're not united, we cannot be united in any kind of anti-movement. Like the recent movement now that's developing and gaining a stronger force, the anti-Pope Francis movement. I was in a sermon the other day on Saturday in St. Mary's. The anti-Pope Francis movement. But one thing to consider that whenever we fight against evil, we must fight against evil, but as Catholics fighting against evil, we must remember we have to fight as Catholics. We have to fight according to the principles of our Holy Roman Catholic faith. And that's very important because there's so many evils in the world. And one of the great ways in which the devil distracts and the devil tries to destroy us is to get us to unite in an anti-movement. And we were so much wanting to stop abortion, like I mentioned the example on Saturday in the sermon in St. Mary's that you watched earlier, that the that the we, 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 we have a danger of being united in the anti-movement, anti-abortion movement, anti-Bishop Follet movement, anti-Pope Francis movement, anti-Bishop Williamson movement, anti-Father Pfeiffer movement. Uh, you can put any anti in there that you want to put. We are not in an anti-movement. And we must remember that, that it's a great temptation. Well, if they're against Pope Francis, well, I'm against Pope Francis. If they're against Vatican II, well, I'm against Vatican II. If they're against the New Mass, well, I'm against the New Mass, and therefore we can be united. Remember, negativity is an absence. Negativity is an absence of an ought good. And an absence is not a glue. An absence doesn't hold us together. And that whenever we're held together by some negative force, that this will must fall apart. It's not a true unity. So that this is the unity of thieves, it's the unity 
of the enemies of God. And right now what's being happened is, is that the Pope Francis, the anti-Pope Francis movement, and the anti-Amor is a movement, uh, and the, the anti, this movement is being used as a trap in order to make souls fall away from God. So we read the other day the 20 page document of the 19 theologians, and the two of them were theologians, I guess, females, uh, writing against Pope Francis, and that they are encouraging the bishops to, to excommunicate Pope Francis and have him truly repent. And while it's true that Pope Francis is teaching heresy, and while it's true that he should correct himself, we must notice that there are some very serious problems with the attack against Pope Francis. So remember, it's just, if you think of it like the anti-abortion movement. In the anti-abortion movement, there are some people that want to end abortion by murdering abortion doctors. If you murder an abortion doctor, you simply create another murder. So you got the murderers of the abortionists, followed by the murder of the one who kills the abortion doctor, and all you did was add another murder. You did no good of any kind, in fact, you did a great evil. To add murder to murder does not end abortion. It doesn't help the fight against abortion either. Evil can never be done that for a good purpose. Remember, we have the principle of the, um, uh, the, the principle of double effect teaches us that you can do a good or an indifferent act, which has two effects, one good and the other one evil. And you can do a good or indifferent act if the good effect outweighs the evil effect. But you can never do something evil that good may come from it, because the end does not justify the means. When we consider the document, the 20-page document, of the 19 theologians and theologians who wrote against Pope Francis, and they said they wrote to the bishops, they were said to the bishops, Pope Francis is already guilty of the delict of heresy. He is already guilty of the crime of heresy, and he has already shown himself to be pertinacious in that heresy, and that the church teaches that whoever is, uh, who is pertinacious in the public crime of heresy is a public heretic and therefore not a member of the church, and hence the Pope Francis must be removed as Pope. This, is this, this argument, which they put together in their 20-page document, is quite simply the normal argument of the city of contests. They also state in their document, we're not say to Vicondus, we recognize that the Pope did not violate his, uh, the Pope did not violate his, his uh, uh, infallible power, because Pope Francis never at any time uses infallible power to promote any heresy, and he never uses infallibility to promote any error, so therefore he did not go against his infallible power, which is correct, Pope Francis did not go against his infallibility, he did not use his, his full authority as Pope ever to promote any or teach any heresy for all Catholics to be to be believed. However, he did teach, and he does teach, errors and heresies. So therefore, it seems as though it's a good thing that these, the, these theologians and theologians are standing up against Pope Francis. But when you look at an attack, consider it from a philosophical, theological, and canonical perspective. That what is, yes, Pope Francis is bad. Yes, Pope Francis is teaching error. Yes, Pope Francis is teaching heresy. No problem. Contato. Does this mean that Pope Francis is a heretic? No, it does not. In particular, when we talk about the delict or the crime of heresy. The delict or crime of heresy is the, one of the arguments of the author is to say that he received a warning and he was pertinacious. What is the warning? It was a theological fraternal correction of the theologians who a year and a half ago or around a year ago wrote a theological fraternal correction. Lay, lay, lay theologians and also some priest theologians and one or two bishops signed the document. Later on others signed their names afterwards including Bishop Fillet. And in this document it points out to Pope Francis, you're guilty of seven heresies. Here are the seven heresies. They are not exhaustive. There are other heresies you may also be guilty of, but here are seven of them. And these heresies are heresies because they're against the teaching of Council of Trent, they're against the teaching of the, of the Fathers of the Church, they're against the teaching of John Paul II, they're against the teaching of Vatican II, they're against the teaching of the New Modernist Catechism of the Catholic Church. And therefore, they're heresies. They list the seven heresies. They put as the proof of the heresies not only true documents of the Church, but they add Vatican II documents and they add John Paul II documents with an equal authority of the uh, documents of the Church. This is already a problem because we don't condemn the abortion because Martin Luther is against abortion. We don't condemn abortion because uh, John Calvin is against abortion. 
We don't quote John Calvin or Martin Luther against abortion because John Calvin and Martin Luther are heretics. John Calvin and Martin Luther are schismatics. John Calvin and Martin Luther have no authority in the church and they are not representatives of Christ. And they are not following the way of the ancients. We condemn modernism, we condemn abortion and all other errors and heresies because it's against the, con the contrary to the teaching of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. Not because it's contrary to the teaching of Martin Luther. Or the contrary of some other, it may be contrary to the Hindus or contrary to the Muslims. We don't say it's because it's contrary to Muslims or Hindus or contrary to the Lutherans. So likewise, we can never say that we condemn the errors and heresies of Pope Francis because of the church's true perennial teaching and the teaching of the Vatican II. No, the teaching of the Vatican II does not hold the authority of the church. Vatican II has in it heretical teaching. We don't accept Vatican II as an authority against anything. We reject that. So that's, another, that's one of the problems. Secondly, when we consider that these, these, uh, these theologians, these 19 theologians and theologians, they say to the bishops that Bishop Pope Francis is pertinacious in his heresy. He did receive a warning. Now, can we consider the, the writing of a theologian or the writing of a theologian against Pope Francis as a canonical warning? The simple answer is no. Now, when you go back to the, to the famous opinion, the five opinions of the bishops of St. Robert Bellarmine concerning the possible loss of office of a heretical pope, in opinion number four and number five, it is made very clear, the two opinions that, that say that he can be removed, opinion number four and five make it very clear that bishops, these are bishops who are members of the Ecclesia Docens, bishops who are members of the teaching church, who carry an authority from Christ. Bishops must gather together and they must say, Dear Holy Father, you are teaching that which is contrary to the ancients. And in the Decretals of Gratian, the Decretal of Gratianus, Distinction 40, Gratianus tells us, Gratian tells us, that the Pope is not subject to any censure, no matter what sin or crime he commits, except in the case of heresy. Then the Pope can be, uh, uh, can be in a certain way judged. Though the Pope is not judged, it is the fact that the Pope is, is, is professing a heresy. Who judges him? The bishops of the church. Now, in the 20-page document of the theologians and theologettes uh, encouraging the bishops to get rid of Pope Francis, one of the problems in that, in that document is that the last part of it, the last half of it, is devoted to pointing out that Pope Francis is wicked, and that Pope Francis has made wicked decrees, and that Pope Francis has promoted heretical and homosexual and immoral superiors as bishops, as cardinals, he put them into positions of authority. He also removed innocent and true and just members of the church. He, he attacked those who have the Catholic faith. He has promoted those who are heretics. He's promoted those that are wicked. Now, according to the teaching of the church, Prima said as the name of the Cator, the decretals of creation, and the perennial teaching of the church, that no matter how wicked the individual command of a pope, so he decides to put a wicked man in charge, he decides to do this wicked act. It is a sinful act for which he can be only judged by God, not by men. He is not subject to a human tribunal for any of his acts or any of his decisions. He is the highest human authority on earth, and therefore no human authority has the power to judge him in his acts. Now, he is, whenever he does a wicked act of jurisdiction, whenever he uses his jurisdictional powers for a wicked purpose, if he commands, uh, if he makes a wicked man a bishop, and a wicked man a cardinal, and a wicked man into positions of authority through simony, through because he's a fellow heretic, because of whatever wicked reason, this act is not subject to punishment. And this is an infallible teaching of the church. The Pope cannot be judged for any of his wicked acts. However, we can defend ourselves against the wicked acts. So if the Pope decides to attack me with a gun, I can defend myself. If the Pope decides to attack me with immorality, commanding me to do immorality, I can say, no, I will not be immoral. I will not follow the immoral decision of the Pope. This is a defense of my soul and a defense of my body. I am allowed to defend myself against an attack of the Pope, but I cannot judge or condemn the Pope. Now, at the end of the 20-page document, 
theologians should not have made this great mistake. The theologians and theologians in the document, they said, Dear bishops, you must see that Pope Francis has already committed the dialect of heresy. He has also demonstrated that he has committed the dialect of heresy by putting wicked men in charge, by putting wicked bishops and wicked cardinals, like Cardinal McCarrick and so on, and giving them, giving them positions of authority and putting wicked men in charge. Therefore, he must show not only that he is no longer holding the heresies that he has promoted, but he must also show a true repentance. The Pope must show a true repentance that he is sorry for those wicked acts that he has done. Now, this statement is very gravely wrong. Very gravely wrong. Because it is a judging of the Pope in his juridical acts. Now, we can stand up against the Pope because of his wicked acts and say no to them. We cannot judge him. We cannot punish him or throw him out because of his wicked acts. In the case of the heresy mentioned by Pope, uh, by St. Robert Bellarmine, by Cajetan, John of St. Thomas, and the other theologians, they make it very clear that the only time which the Pope is even subject to being dealt with and possibly thrown out of the balcony of St. Peter's is when the Pope promotes, teaches heresy. And they also make it very clear, no matter how wicked the moral and immoral acts of the Pope are, Popes have murdered cardinals, Popes have, have promoted homosexuals in the past. Popes have promoted heretics in the past. Popes have promoted every single sin against the Ten Commandments and promoted every wicked kind of individual in the last 2,000 years. It is not new. The wickedness of popes goes back to the time of St. Peter, the first pope to be wicked. And from that time forward, there have been many popes who have done great and evil and wicked acts. They cannot be judged for those acts. Only God will judge them. And God will judge them most severely when they go to the judgment seat of God. They will be judged most severely. God will take care of that judgment. So it is a very grave mistake of the theologians in their 20-page document, a very grave mistake of the theologians to say that we, uh, we, we show that by the wicked statements and by the wicked acts of Pope Francis, promoting these wicked individuals and making these wicked decisions, he must be, the bishops must show that not only will the Pope not teach error and heresy, but the Pope is going to show a true repentance. What does that mean? It means the bishops are going to judge the Pope in his authority. And that is the heresy of conciliarism, and it's a heresy. Remember, you cannot do evil that good may come of it. That Pope Francis is a wicked Pope, and a wicked Pope is to be replaced by a good Pope, that's a good thing. But that you do something evil that is, quote-unquote, murder the wicked Pope, that is, remove the wicked Pope by a wicked means, you have done evil that a good may come of it. And this is a trap. We cannot fall into that trap. Pope Francis cannot be judged by men. He was elected as a representative of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is a descendant and the vicar of our Lord Jesus Christ and a descendant of St. Peter. He sits in the chair of Peter. When he teaches heresy, we can say, that is heresy. We do not accept it. We defend ourselves against your heresy, Holy Father. We will not obey your decrees. There is an infinite difference or get, uh, jump between being disobedient to the Holy Father because he is commanding error and heresy and saying, I am going to judge you. When you consider the five opinions of St. Robert Bellarmine, the third opinion is of great interest, the opinion of Beard. And, and this opinion, says, St. Robert says, Beard says, if the Pope teaches heresy, and the Pope professes heresy, you have to live with it, defend yourself against it. God gave us defenses against the heresy. Don't believe the heresy. Uh, preach against the heresy, but you can't judge the Pope. And let God judge him when he dies. And furthermore, says Bier, if the Pope was judged, guess what's going to happen? There will be Catholic theologians and Catholic bishops who will say, you can't judge the Pope, I'm going to stay with him. There will be others that say, well, we're going to follow the new pope, and you will have a schism in the church, so that some will follow the old pope, who isn't going to accept his resignation, his, his uh, demise, and some will follow the new pope, and instead of in a better situation, we will have a worse situation, because we'll have an actual man, Pope Francis, for instance, who is going to be demoted by the College of Cardinals. It'll never happen, but in theory it could happen. They're going to be demoted by the College of Cardinals, 
because he's a bad man. Now, if, he's, if he is demoted because he's a bad man, the demotion is meaningless. And with regard to the pertinacity, can he be considered pertinacious? The simple answer is no. He cannot be considered pertinacious because a warning from theologians and theologettes does not equal a warning. Bishops of the church who represent Christ must give the warning. Bishops of the church need to stand up and say, we are gathering together as bishops of our Holy Mother Church. We are not judging you, Holy Father, directly, but we are saying that you, Holy Father, have stated these heresies. We will demonstrate to you that these heresies, such as the Muslims and the Catholics worship the same God, happens to be contrary to the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you please correct that? Because the Pope does not have authority over God. He does not have authority over the Gospel. He has authority only over men. So we have no problem with your authority over men, but you do not have authority over the Gospel. Now if the Pope then refuses to accept the, the, the correction of bishops, not lay people, not auxiliary bishops, but bishops of dioceses, representatives of Christ, and then, and then he says, no, I refuse. Then it's possible for the bishops to say, all right, we got opinion number four. You're still Pope, but you're deposable. Like Cajetan says, and John of St. Thomas says, because the degree of grace tells us what you hold as a very great authority in all of canon law, that the Pope cannot be judged in any of his most, no matter how wicked are his decisions, no matter how wicked are his, his, his acts as Pope, except in the case of heresy. This is the case of heresy. So therefore, we're, we're going to say we're sorry, but since the Pope is a defender of the faith, Holy Father, you are no longer defending the faith. You are professing error and heresy. We've had many wicked Popes. We've had Popes even that were personal heretics. Because if a Pope was a personal heretic and a private heretic, that's fine. He can be a private heretic. He can be a personal heretic. But if he is promoting this heresy upon the church, the, the bishops, the shepherds of the flock, defend the flock by standing for the truth and commanding the Pope to say, I'm sorry, but you cannot hold these errors and heresies. When these theologians say, the Pope must be considered, Francis must be considered right now in 2019, he must be considered as pertinacious. No, that's not correct. Here's one of our challenges. We argue against the error, the grave error of state of ecumenism, which is a grave error uh, that is contrary to the theological teaching of the church. And then, if we follow this teaching of these uh, new theologians, we follow to the error of state of ecumenism. That they say that Pope Francis is already a manifest heretic, who is already publicly and manifestly a heretic according to the definition of a manifest heretic, and the answer is no. He doesn't fulfill the delict of heresy until he has received the three canonical warnings which are required by the divine law. As St. Augustine says, no matter how horrible is the belief, no matter how bad is the heresy of any man, he cannot be considered an enemy of the church or outside the church if, after receiving warnings, he were to repent. And we cannot know whether he would repent. Pascal II was a heretic. And Pascal II did not believe in the, uh, in, in the he, believe, he believed in the heresy of, of um, uh, the uh, lay investiture. And when he was threatened by St. Evo of Chartres and threatened by St. Edo, he said, Evo is going to take away my tiara. He was terrified of St. Evo, and therefore, because of his fear, he backed down from his heresy. Had he not been afraid, he would not have backed down. He would have stayed a heretic. Pascal II backed down out of fear. Now what's going to happen to a normal man? Say Pope Francis, if he is threatened, we are going to throw you off the balcony. We're going to pick you up, we're going to throw you, and you're going to splatter on the ground. It's not going to feel good. So now are you ready to accept that? Are you ready to be defrocked? Are you ready to have your white uh, cassock of the Pope removed? Are you ready to be thrown out into the exile? Are you ready for that? Are you ready to accept that? And the Pope may say, no, I don't want to accept that. What paper do you want me to sign? I will sign it. We do not know that Pope Francis will be pertinacious. The proof of his pertinacity will only come when cardinals and bishops, bishops stand up and say, Pope, 
Holy Father, you have taught these heresies. Here's the heresy. It only need to be one heresy. So you teach that there is that, that the Muslim God and the Catholic God are the same. This heresy is taught by Vatican II, by the way. It's also taught by John Paul II. And it is taught by the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So we can't say we're going to quote the Catechism of the Catholic Church against Pope Francis. We're going to quote Vatican II against Pope Francis. We're going to quote John Paul II against Pope Francis when they held the same heresy. When, they, when John Paul II also committed the same sins that Francis committed by kissing the Koran, by praying with the, with, the, with the enemies of God, doing an act of worship which indicates that, this, that the Catholic Church is not the true church. These theologians are making a grave mistake in many ways, and one way they're making a grave mistake is by saying, we're going to quote John Paul II, who kissed the Koran, against Pope Francis, who prays with the guys, who, who prays with the ones who hold the Koran. We're going to quote Pope, uh, the, the, uh, the immorality of the immoral teaching of, uh, of Pope um, Francis, and we're going to quote against that Pope Benedict. And Pope Benedict is one who said that a homosexual prostitute begins to be moral when he uses a condom. And this is, how can you say that that is against the homosexuality? He put that in his actual book as Pope. He wrote that in a book, The Light of the World, for the whole world to read. And you don't have a problem with Pope Benedict? If you're going to say that Pope Francis is a public manifest heretic, you must say also that Pope Benedict is a public manifest heretic. And don't ever... Quote Pope Benedict against Pope Francis. Don't quote John Paul, John Paul II against Pope Francis. So we must remember that in an, we are not united in an anti-movement. While it is good to say that Pope Francis is teaching error and heresy, we must defend ourselves against his errors and heresies. We are not to do so in such a way that we go against the practice of the church and go against the teaching of the church. And remember, like I mentioned the other day, that this is a grave trap. It's a grave trap. To unite people, we're against Pope Francis. If we're divided amongst ourselves, we can't, we can't throw Pope Francis out. So let's get together. Let's get the SSPX together with the Fraternity of St. Peter, with the, the theologians of the Novus Ordo. Let's get together and let's pressure the bishops to throw out Pope Francis. And if they do this on the grounds of that 20-page document, there are grave errors in the grounds of the 20-page document which go against the teaching of the Church for the last 2,000 years. What will happen? What will happen is we will discover that there's going to be a committee created that's going to be to judge the Pope to make sure he's not a heretic. We can't allow such a committee. No matter how wicked the Holy Father is, he is the representative of Christ and he is the vicar of Christ. If that Holy Father does wicked things, we can condemn the wicked things he does. If he commands a wicked command, we can disobey those wicked commands. If he teaches heresy, we can say we will not follow the heresy. Furthermore, we will resist him to the face. It is a duty of eternal correction. St. Pius X, or rather St. Thomas Aquinas says in question 33 of the Secunda Secunde of the St. Thomas Aquinas of, uh, about eternal correction. He asks the question, can you correct a superior and the answer is yes. And it's interesting, the argument against it. You should not quest a superior because when the Ark represents the, the heart of the church, the Ark of the Covenant. And one day the Ark tilted and a man, Oza, went and touched the Ark and he was killed immediately by God. Therefore, you should not question the Mount or the Ark. And if any Jew climbed the Holy Mount where the presence of God was, they were killed. Hence, you cannot attack the superior. And St. Thomas Aquinas responds and says, no, that's not correct. For when the ark tilted, the ark was not in grave danger of falling over. The ark was simply moving on the horse and it tilted. And Oza, without just reason, not being a priest of God, touched the ark. And therefore he was killed by God because he didn't have sufficient reason to touch the ark. If the ark was going to collapse completely, perhaps he could have touched it, but the ark simply tilted, the ark of the covenant simply tilted, and Oza went and touched it, and therefore God struck him dead, because he did not have sufficient reason. Furthermore, Oza was struck dead by God, says St. Thomas, because he was not respectful. For a man that is not a priest should not touch the ark of the covenant, and therefore he did so with insolence. Hence he was struck dead by God. Hence, in the correction of a superior, we can correct a superior, including the Holy Father. We can correct a superior when the superior goes against the faith, especially. 
and but the but we must recognize the authority and the dignity of the superior and we should never be insolent and we should never degrade his position but speak about him with a certain respect concerning his position and status and therefore it go against him in his position and status we can correct the holy father but not with insolence not with disrespect and not in a wrong way when the holy father is simply dug up his sins and when the holy father it is said of him we can't we we can judge him because of the fact that uh, he has done all these wicked things no these are not the reasons for the judgment a proper way to put together the 20 page document is to make the document much shorter and for the theologians and, uh, to put together not theologians to put together a document that says here are one two three four heresies of pope francis there are others but here are the heresies this is the heretical statement he said that the muslims and the jews worship the, and catholics worship the same god and here is the truth muslims worship the devil catholics worship the true god and the, the, the muslims don't believe in the trinity and catholics do they do not worship the same god muslims do not believe jesus christ is god we know that he is therefore this is a heretical statement it is against the sacred scripture it is against the gospel it's against the teaching of the church do not quote the teaching of vatican II. do not quote the teaching of pope francis don't quote a document which agrees with the heresy when you quote Vatican II, you're quoting a document that agrees with the heresy. Don't quote those things. Quote only correct documents. And then point out, this is a grave heresy. And all Catholics should know this. Ask the bishops to get together and say, Dear Holy Father, here is the heresy. This is the teaching of our Holy Mother of the Church. Why are you holding this heresy? Why are you not following the teaching of our Holy Mother of the Church? Please correct this. If the Holy Father, after two warnings, refuses to do so, then they, the theologians, then they must decide what is to be done. And there are three, two possibilities. One is that the bishops can say to the faithful, the Holy Father, we are, he is still the Holy Father, and there's nothing we can do except to warn the flock. Don't listen to his sermons. Don't obey him. And he can say the Pope, just like the Bishop of Bombay, stayed the Bishop of Bombay. The Bishop of Bombay, back 150 years ago, displeased the people of Bombay. I forget which bishop it was. And he didn't want to move a statue from one place to another. He said, I am the bishop, I am in charge. They said, fine, you're the bishop, you're in charge. So they took concrete and stone, and they built a stone door all the way around the cathedral. And they said, you're in charge of the cathedral, it's your home. And they put a stone door in the back, a stone door in the front, a stone door on the side. And then they looked at the window every couple of days and said, how do you like being in charge of the cathedral? Are you getting hungry? He was in charge of the cathedral. He was locked in the cathedral and couldn't get out. After three days, he said, you know what? I think I'll move the statues. Okay. So then they took down the stone doors. So they can say, you're still the Holy Father. You can stay inside the Sistine Chapel and put a little concrete door up. Turn off all the cell phone service. And then, and then hand food through the door. And then when, when there's no more food, then go ahead and get a new pope. So that's one option. That he is still the Holy Father, but we must warn the faithful, don't listen to him, don't follow him. A second option is the option of St. John, St. Robert Bellarmine and, and Ken Cajetan. And that is, the cardinals are to say, this man, we are not deposing him, God has deposed him. We are not judging him, God has judged him. And this Holy Father, Pope Francis... He is no longer to be accepted as the Holy Father because he's pertinaciously held doctrine contrary to Jesus Christ. He is removed by God, and therefore they take him and remove him and lock him up. Then they have a conclave and elect a new pope. But they cannot, and it cannot punish him or even mention properly in the punishment, you are being punished because you have murdered. You are being punished because you have put wicked men in charge. You are being punished because of any immoral act of the Pope. They cannot mention this in the trial. Why is that? Because prima sedes a nemine judicator. The first see is judged by no one. They don't have the right to judge the first see in any of its acts. Only God can judge it that way. He is created by God. He is elected by men. His authority comes from God. It is the authority of the Holy Father. It is the authority of Pope uh, St. Peter cannot be judged by men. Therefore, there should not be even mentioned in the trial 
this trial of the judgment of the papacy, of the Pope, there should not even be mentioned in the trial his immoral acts, his wicked acts. It should not even be mentioned. Only the actual crime, which, which, which Graziano says, we can hold as the only way in which a Pope may be judged, and that is for the crime of heresy. Only that crime, that is, here, Holy Father, you taught this error, you taught this heresy, you wrote this error, you wrote that heresy, and this error in heresy is not just private, because unfortunately, because you have spoken it, it has led to the loss of many souls, and souls are believing the error in heresy that you teach. We want you to stop teaching this error and heresy. We are not judging you, but judging according to Christ. Because Christ said you cannot teach that there are two gods. That there is one God for the Muslims, which is not the Blessed Trinity. And there is another God, the true God, which is the Blessed Trinity. No, there is only one God, and he is the Blessed Trinity. You must go back to the acceptance of that God. And you must repudiate the false gods and say that I reject the false god of the Muslims. I reject the false gods of all. I accept only the true God and all his teachings. When you have done that... We let go, and we obey you. Remember when, when Nebuchadnezzar was the king. For seven years, he thought that he was a cow. He was very proud, and God punished him and said, You're going to see how proud you are. And he thought he was a cow, and he drank milk and ate grass for seven years. During those seven years, the, the, uh, uh, the, the people of Babylon, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, uh, the Babylonians, they recognized Nebuchadnezzar as king, but he just couldn't rule. So they fed him grass, let him drink milk, and then they just ran the kingdom administratively. After seven years, Nebuchadnezzar woke up. He realized he wasn't a cow. He realized that milk was not the only drink out there. And he became back to himself. And immediately, the regions that ran the kingdom of Babylon immediately said, Okay, he's still the, he's still the king. He is still the emperor. And they immediately obeyed him. And he, he realized that he, was, he should stop his pride, and he took over his reins in the kingdom. They did, not take, they did not remove him, and they recognized him as the king. And, the, and, the, and so, that, so likewise, in the situation of the judging of the Holy Father, the administration only can be taken care of, but they cannot say he is judged because of his wicked acts, no matter how wicked they are, period. This is contrary to the doctrine of our Holy Mother, the Church. They, they could perhaps gather together the bishops and only do two things. One, def or, or, or warn the faithful, which they must do in both cases, don't listen to the Holy Father. Protect the flock of Christ because he's teaching error and heresy. And just wait for him to die and let God take care of him. And when he dies, then try to elect a better pope. Option B, warn the faithful and then take the pope and say we have a special ceremony called the Day of Throwing Pope Francis Off the Balcony Ceremony. And they go to the ceremony and they remove him Remove his white cassock, remove his, uh, his, uh, his, uh, his papal ring, and say he's not the, no longer the Holy Father because he has taught heresy and he's removed by the power of God, not by the power of men, and only for the heresy that he has taught and not for any other wicked acts. We do not judge him for his murders. We don't judge him for his putting heretics in positions of authority. We don't judge him for any immoral act that he may have done. We do not judge any of them. Only God can judge those things. We judge only that he has decided to teach heresy and he has decided pertinaciously to not step back from that heresy and to defend our Holy Mother, the Church. We remove him. Then the election of a new Pope. And so those are the acceptable things that could be done. But not pointing out all his immoral acts, as is done in that 20-page document, and not uh, that, uh, saying that this equals a warning against the Pope because we theologians uh, did it in some document that does not come from the bishops, does not come from the authority of the church, does not, did, did we have given you a warning. No, that does not equal a warning. The paternal correction of last year does not equal a warning. If that was the case, we could say that all the corrections of anyone is a warning. No, there is a reason there is a rule to the church why we say there's a delict of heresy. There's a delict of heresy. The delict of heresy is a crime, and it, was, it must be conceived as such. The other delicts of murder, the delicts of putting wrong people in authority, they are not the delict of heresy. They're, they should not be considered. Only the delict of heresy. And the delict of heresy equals to teach a heretical, doc, a heretical statement publicly and manifestly, in writing, in speech, that can be verified that he preached those things. No problem in the case of Pope Francis. He has many of them. And then to demonstrate, not only is he taught the heresy, but here is the truth being shown plainly to him what the truth is. When he decides to reject that truth anyway, 
And after the third time of rejecting it, and, that, and as uh, St. Thomas Aquinas points out, this is by divine law. There must be a triple warning by divine law because God wants to show that he will not judge any man who has not shown himself to be pertinacious, to be stubborn in his wickedness. He will not judge a man simply because he says something wicked, teaches something wicked, but he must be pertinacious in his teaching. Then he is judged. And so the, the, this is very important, especially in the case of a Holy Father, because the Pope is not judged by the Council of Bishops. He's only judged by God. And therefore all that is done is that the Council of Bishops demonstrates this Holy Father has been warned by us as representatives of Christ, the Church teaching. Only the Pope and Bishop of the Diocese represent the Church teaching. We as representatives of the Church teaching, the Ecclesia Docens, say to the Holy Father, with our authority as bishops, not against him, but that we know the teachings of our Holy Mother of the Church. Here are the teachings of your ancestors, your predecessors. Here are the teachings of our ancestors in the faith. You are going contrary to that teaching in point A. Only need one point. You don't believe that the Catholic God is a true God. Fine. Therefore, you have, you, you have chosen to not uh, accept that the Catholic God is a true God. You have chosen pertinaciously to reject the Catholic God. Therefore, you are a heretic. And for the good of the church, we have to remove you. And we are not doing this on our authority. We're doing it on the authority of God. In order to make this abundantly clear, it is most necessary to not bring up his moral problems. This must not be done. But if we condemn him because of his moral problems or because of his wickedness there, that means that, that the judgment is null and void and guilty of the heresy of conciliarism. It is a grave, grave error when the 20 theologians say, Dear bishops, dear bishops, in your condemnation, you must not only show, Pope Francis must not only show that he does not believe in the heresies anymore, he must show that he's truly repentant. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. He does not have to show that he's truly repentant. In order that he be removed, what is necessary is to prove that he is unrepentant, prove that he has not, uh, prove that he absolutely is pertinacious in his evil. But if he has not proven to be pertinacious in his evil, then he must be left alone. It is not, not, not at all acceptable to say, not only must you prove that you are not pertinacious in evil, but you must show that you're truly repentant. Absolutely not. This is gravely wrong. We can never do an, uh, uh, try to achieve a good purpose by evil means. So let's not fall into this trap of the anti-Pope Francis movement. And remember also, what happens when you throw him out? Have you fixed anything? No. Just like in our anti-Bishop Fillet movement. How many people said in 2012, get rid of Bishop Fillet and the problems will be solved? It's now 2019. A few months ago, Bishop Fillet was thrown out. Now we've got Father Pagliarotti. Guess what? The problem is not solved. Because if it's getting rid of Bishop Fillet doesn't fix anything. It's getting rid of the errors. Getting rid of the, the false direction and teaching of the Society of St. Pius X. Getting rid of the heresies. Getting rid of the errors. Getting rid of the bad direction. That's what must be done. Not the bad people. So likewise in our Holy Mother of the Church, there's too much of a consideration of persons today. Get rid of Pope Francis and everything's going to be fine. And another grave error, we mentioned in the sermon on Saturday, we mentioned again, forgot to mention here, is that one of the grave mistakes, very grave errors by the 20 theologians, at the very beginning of their statement, they said, Pope Francis has brought on an unprecedented crisis in the church. And this statement is completely false. Vatican II brought us Pope Francis. Vatican II brought us Pope Francis' teachings. Vatican II brought us Pope Francis' practice. And all that Pope Francis is doing is teaching and putting into practice Vatican II. It is not Pope Francis that brought an unprecedented crisis. It's Vatican II that brought an unprecedented crisis. Removing Pope Francis will not remove the crisis. Removing Pope Francis will not fix the problem. Because the heresies of Vatican II remain. They're still in the dioceses. They're still in the council documents. They're still in the ecumenical teachings of the various uh, bishops' conferences and all of their ecumenical garbage that they put out in their Episcopal conferences. They're still all over the church. They're still being taught in the seminaries throughout the entire world. How does throwing Pope Francis out fix that? It doesn't fix anything. It doesn't repair anything. The crisis in the church is a crisis of faith. And this crisis of faith is found in the seminaries. It is found in the dioceses. It is found in the Episcopal conferences. It is found everywhere in the Holy Mother Church today. Getting rid of Pope Francis doesn't fix anything. What must be done is to be rid of the errors, to be rid of the heresies, and to replace these errors and heresies with the truth. And 
And then, when that is done, then it's possible for good bishops to do some good. But what are these good bishops doing? These good bishops believe in Vatican II. These good bishops believe in the doctrine of Vatican II. So that therefore they don't have a right on their own foundation. They're standing on the foundation of Vatican II. They have no right to condemn Pope Francis on the grounds of doctrine. No right whatsoever. So we need to make sure that we don't fall into this trap of the anti-Pope Francis movement. And remember that while it's good to be against the errors and heresies of the Pope, we must not at all uh, violate the teaching of our Holy Mother of the Church that the first see is judged by no one, and the only case in which it might be possible to judge a Pope is in his teaching of heresy, and only bishops can do that who gather together to defend the flock of the Church as members of the Ecclesia Docens, the Church teaching, and not anyone else. As for the rest of us, we defend ourselves against the errors, we defend ourselves against the heresies, we do not obey the commands of the Pope, we resist the will of the Pope, no problem. These are all good things. But we do not have the right to judge him. God alone shall be his judge. The Lord bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost.